This is a revision video for AQA GCSE Chemistry and Combined Science, looking at the second topic, Structure and Bonding. This video is a list of questions that are based purely on the specification and the facts that you need to be able to recall. You can find a list of questions in the description below and use these to make flashcards or to test yourself on your understanding of these key points, before moving on to questions that ask you to apply your knowledge. The three types of strong chemical bond are metallic bonds, ionic bonds and covalent bonds. In metallically bonded substances, we find positive ions surrounded by a sea of delocalised electrons. In ionically bonded substances, there are oppositely charged ions arranged together in a giant ionic lattice. And in covalently bonded substances, we find atoms that share pairs of electrons. Metallic elements will form metallic bonds. Mixtures of metallic and non-metallic elements will form ionic bonds. And non-metallic elements will form covalent bonds. In a pure metal, you find regular rows of positive ions surrounded by a sea of delocalised electrons. These are held together by a strong electrostatic force of attraction between the positive ions and the negative electrons. Metals have high melting points because this strong electrostatic force of attraction requires a lot of energy to overcome. Metals are good electrical conductors because the delocalised electrons are free to move and carry charge through the metal. An alloy is a mixture of metals, or at least a mixture in which the main component is a metal, because of course you can have alloys like steel, which also contain carbon. Alloys are harder than pure metals, and the reason for this is that the differently sized particles disrupt those regular rows, and this means that they can no longer slide easily over each other. As you can see in this diagram here, the much larger ions have distorted the layers. Ionic bonds form due to the transfer of electrons. This will happen from a metal to a non-metal, so from left to right across the periodic table. An ion is a charged particle formed when an atom gains or loses electrons. When you're working out how many electrons need to move in order to form ions, you should know that group one will always lose one electron, group two will always lose two electrons, group six will always gain two electrons, and group seven will always gain one electron. This will allow these atoms to have a full outer shell. In order to work out how many of each ion is necessary in a compound, you need to compare the charges. So overall, you need to have the same number of positive and negative charges. The easiest way to do this is by looking for lowest common multiples. So for instance, if you have iron 3 plus and oxygen 2 minus, the lowest common multiple of 3 and 2 is 6. So to get 6 positives, you'll need 2 iron ions. And to get six negatives, you'll need three oxygen ions. So therefore we have Fe2O3. To draw a lithium ion, we start with a lithium atom. This has three electrons because the atomic number of lithium is three. As we know, elements in group one will always lose one electron to gain a full outer shell and produce an ion. So our lithium atom loses one electron, and therefore we don't need to draw the second shell. To show that this is now a positively charged ion, we add square brackets and a single positive charge. To draw an oxide ion, we go through the reverse process because oxygen is a non-metal, so it's going to gain electrons. So here's my oxygen atom, which has eight electrons because the atomic number of oxygen is eight. In order to get a full outer shell, it needs to gain two electrons. And I also know this because oxygen is in group six. So it gains one electron and then a second electron, both donated from a metal. And then again, we need square brackets to show that it's now a charged ion and a two minus charge because it's gained two negative electrons. The overall structure made by an ionic compound is a giant ionic lattice. This is held together by a strong electrostatic force of attraction between the oppositely charged ions. Ionic compounds are solids at room temperature because this strong electrostatic force of attraction requires a huge amount of energy to overcome. If you count up all of the positive and negative ions in the diagram, you'll find that there are twice as many negative ions as positive ions. The negative ion always goes second in the compound formula. So we're going to have positive ion, negative ion, two. So for instance, this could be magnesium chloride. The problem with using dot and cross models for ionic bonding is that it implies that there are only a couple of ions involved, whereas actually a giant ionic lattice is going to involve thousands and thousands of ions. The ball and stick model of ionic bonding is problematic because it implies that those bonds are physical entities that we could reach out and touch, rather than just the force of attraction between the ions. 
Ionic compounds can conduct electricity as long as the ions are free to move, which means they either need to be molten or dissolved to make an aqueous solution. This is because electricity is the flow of charged particles, and if the charged particles aren't free to move, they can't flow. Covalent bonds are shared pairs of electrons. The eight named examples in your specification of small or simple covalent molecules are hydrogen, chlorine, hydrogen chloride, water, methane, ammonia, oxygen and nitrogen. These molecules can either be drawn using dot and cross diagrams or with straight lines for the bonds. These molecules will be held together by a weak intermolecular force. These small covalent molecules all have relatively low melting and boiling points because the intermolecular forces between them are weak and these do not take much energy to overcome. However, it's really, really important that you understand that it's the weak intermolecular forces between two different molecules that need to be overcome. It's not the strong covalent bonds inside the molecule. These do not break. Small covalent molecules are not able to conduct electricity because the overall molecule has no charge and so it's not possible for any charged particles to move. Polymers are very long chains of repeating units called monomers. The monomer is the small molecule that can bond to other molecules of the same type to form a polymer. It's the repeating unit. The monomers in a polymer are held together by strong covalent bonds. If you know the name of the monomer, then the name of the polymer will just be poly followed by the name of that monomer. So for instance, polyethene or polypropene. Polymers are often solids at room temperature because they are very, very large molecules. So although it's only weak intermolecular forces holding the polymer chains together, those are comparatively strong because the molecule is so large. There are lots of different examples of a polymer that you could have drawn here, but the important thing is the overall form. So when we're drawing polymers in shorthand, it's important that you've got a single bond in the middle and then bonds sticking out left and right outside of your brackets. We've got brackets around that repeating unit and then we've then got an N there to show that there are many, many of this repeating unit. The four named examples of giant covalent structures in your specification are diamond, graphite, fullerenes and silica. Giant covalent structures are always solids at room temperature. Diamond and graphite are made from carbon. In diamond, each carbon atom makes four strong covalent bonds, and in graphite, each carbon atom makes three strong covalent bonds, leaving one electron free to be delocalized. In graphite, these carbon atoms form hexagonal structures. Diamond is very, very hard due to the strong covalent bonds, which prevent all the carbon atoms from being able to move. Graphite, on the other hand, is soft and slippery because the carbon atoms are arranged in those hexagonal sheets and these can easily slide over each other because there are no bonds between the layers. Graphite can conduct electricity due to that delocalised electron from each carbon atom. This is free to move and carry charge through the substance. Graphene is a single layer of graphite. It can be used in electronics and also in composites. Fullerenes are hollow molecules made out of carbon, and the first one to be discovered was C60, which is called Buckminster fullerene. Carbon nanotubes are cylindrical fullerenes with very high length to diameter ratios. In other words, they can be a few atoms across, but incredibly long in length. They're useful for nanotechnology, electronics, and also strengthening materials. Nanoparticles are between 1 and 100 nanometers across, and they can contain up to a few hundred atoms, although of course some of them, such as Buckminster fullerene, contain even fewer than this. Fine and coarse particles are two other classes of particles that are a little bigger than nanoparticles, but not quite as small. Fine particles, also known as particulate matter 2.5, are up to 2.5 micrometers across. In other words, they're between 100 and 2,500 nanometers. Coarse particles, also known as particulate matter 10, because they can be up to 10 micrometers across, are between 2,500 and 10,000 nanometers across. Coarse particles are also known as dust. Nanoparticles have different properties due to their high surface area to volume ratio, and they can be used for medicines, electronics, cosmetics, sun creams, deodorants and catalysts. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you found this useful in revising for Unit 2 Chemistry. 
If you did find it useful, then don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE chemistry content coming soon.